This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Jeffer today. Professor Jeffer received her BA from Drake University and her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana. She comes to Cornell from the English Department uh, at Penn State University and is the author of three books. First one is called At Home with Pornography, Sex, Women's Sex and Everyday Life, published in 1998. Uh, the second is called Single Mother, The Emergence of the Domestic Intellectual in 2006. And those two were both published by New York University Press. And her third book is called Intimacy Across Borders, Race, Religion, and Migration in the U.S. Midwest. And that was published by Temple University Press in 2013. 2013, so it's brand new. Um, her scholarship also includes work in the areas of Latino studies and cultural studies, as well as, I think, more recently, kids' pop culture. Uh, she has a joint appointment in the Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies program, where she currently serves as Director of Undergraduate Studies, as well as an appointment in the English Department. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jeffer. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you all for coming in this miserable weather. It's nice to see everybody here. The title of my talk is Outside Literature, and I actually stole that title from um, a cultural studies scholar named Tony Bennett. Um, and I really consider my work cultural studies, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit of what that means using my books as an example. Um, so what does that mean to say one is outside literature? Um, it does, I think, in some ways mean positioning oneself on the margins of the discipline of English. Um, a discipline which clearly studies not just literature but other cultural texts as well. Um, but I think somewhat ironically, the um, goal of positioning oneself on the margins is probably to better understand culture's potential. So let me explain what that means. So Bennett says, this is a quote, there are two approaches to literature, one which occupies a place within the space of the literary and work, work, which works with it as a terrain of practices implicated in the formation of subjectivities. So that's one, that's not the approach I'm taking. And second, um, adopting a position outside literature in order to write its history as a history of functions, rules, techniques, and institutions. In short, a history like any other, a history of surfaces without any hidden depths or secreted interiors to fathom. So that's the approach he um, takes and which I adhere to as well. Um, and this, I should say, like, this is a kind of um, approach to cultural studies which has its roots in the Birmingham School. Um, if some of you follow at all, Stuart Hall died um, two weeks ago. He was sort of one of the founders or certainly um, foundational in the development of cultural studies in Britain. So that's where Tony Bennett comes from as well. So keep in mind this kind of idea that we're working with literature. I'm working with literature as a more kind of su surface phenomenon. Um, here's another quote from Bennett. Literature is itself a field of social relationships in its own right, and one which interacts with other fields in which social relationships are organized and constituted in the same way as they interact with it and on the same level. So for Bennett to theorize literature um, is to think about it historically and institutionally which is to imbue it with a concrete existence. Um, and it allows, what I'm trying to get at here, what I like about his work is it allows us to ask questions about literature treated as a discursive field that's really not all that different from any other field, like medical discourse or legal discourse. There's nothing, in other words, inherently more enlightening about literary texts or more special about literature. There is something very specific about literature. Um, we need to look at how it circulates as a particular kind of discourse, so it's not to say like literature is the same thing as a phone book or a legal brief. Um, but it's no more um, able to tell us what's going on in the world than any other discourse. So text should not be read through to their underlying social conditions. Um, there's nothing inherently more insightful about literature, no reason to accord it the ability to explain social conditions. So we can read Beloved to talk about racism, but what Beloved has to say about racism is no more enlightening than another kind of text about race. So literature is a field or a way of writing that organizes a set of social relationships. 
um, the same way in which other fields are, are, are organized. So this has to do with, um, I don't see right now, um, what's the hands in my quote? So you've heard me in cultural studies classes, if you've taken me, talk about the need to think about um, how texts circulate in the world. Um, so we can't, um, this, this is where sort of my claim that we might better understand literature or culture's potential by looking not just at what the text means, but how it circulates in the world. Um, not simply asserting its power, but really actually trying to demonstrate what it's doing in the world. Um, so for example, my first book, which was my dissertation, um, was about pornography for women. Um, and I did my PhD in an English department, so I, it was textual to a degree, unlike the most recent book, which probably has, I think, has no literature in it at all. Um, but so I was trying to figure out at that point um, what it meant to look at literature as a social field and not to accord it any kind of special powers. Um, so I looked across a wide range of texts um, that were marketed for women as women's fill in the blank, erotica, porn, self-help. That was one of my questions, is how different things get marketed. And then I put those texts, so those texts went across literary anthologies, um, television, kind of premium television, cable, video, internet. Um, so I looked at a wide variety of texts. Um, I also looked at a lot of governmental regulation on women in the home and this kind of idea that um, you know, sexually explicit materials in the home were a danger, particularly to kids, so I did a lot with mothering there. Um, I looked at self-help texts, um, I looked at lingerie catalogs, um, so I tried in this sort of um, somewhat kind of didactic way that you might think of for a dissertation um, to, to construct a discursive formation of all these texts that um, were purporting to represent women's desires. Without, um, what I was really interested in as well, is without trying to read these texts for sort of the truth of what they said about women's desires, um, which was then part of the whole debate about, and still is to some degree, pornography and you know erotica being the good kind of porn and porn being the bad kind of porn. So I was contesting that distinction and saying, really I'm much more interested in what these whether women have access to sexually explicit texts within the routines of their everyday lives. I'm not really that concerned about um, what, what kind of fantasy or truth of desire this represents. Um, similarly in the book I wrote on single mothering, I was really interested, although that has less, I guess my work has moved less and less, more and more away from culture so, or literature, so to speak. So I started writing that book when, as a single mother, I started noticing a lot of TV shows about single mothers and watching a lot of TV shows about single mothers. And this would have been, I guess I started writing that maybe 10, maybe 2000, so, you know, 15, 14, 12 years ago. So. Um, it was a sort of moment I identified as a shift in the discourse around single mothers. Up, single mothers up to that point had been quite demonized in popular culture. And then all of a sudden you started to see like a lot of TV shows and films which were like treating the single mother as this sort of heroic figure. So in order to sort of trace that phenomenon, I looked at, um, I had one chapter on literature and film and TV, but I was also interested then in a whole bunch of other texts that were talking about single mothering, like welfare debates and legal discourse and divorce law and new reproductive technologies and how women don't, didn't need men anymore to have babies and that kind of thing. Um, so again, I was sort of looking more at what these texts, to the degree that I looked at texts, um, said about what it meant to be a, a single mother at that point in time, and my argument was it was fine to be a single mother as long as you were completely independent and didn't need welfare or any kind of help at all. Um, so what does this kind of view I'm tracing of outside literature mean for the job of the critic? Like if you think about our jobs, um, if you're an English major or minor or interested in that, or for those of us who are professors, I think it's... Um, kind of a, a radically different way of looking at our jobs. I try not to see myself as an interpreter of text who's seeking the kind of deep meaning of the text. Um, this is kind of going back to Tony Bennett's argument. Um, the problems, I think, with that approach is that it positions the critic in this position of kind of moral exemplar who's kind of guiding the reader, you the reader, you the student, through the correct reading of a text. Um, and I find that problematic because it is um, somewhat moralistic, it can be moralistic, and it suggests again that the meaning to whatever phenomenon you're looking at inheres in the text. 
Um, and that, you know, at the point at which you're guided through the correct reading, then you can sort of join the ranks of the morally enlightened. Um, so I'm interested in how um, those kinds of claims circulate rather than how they inhere in the text. Um, so finally, I th I'll say just a little bit about the, my latest book. Um, I was trying to think, what text do I have in here? And so, because um, it's a book, just to give you some background, it's a book about, um, what's it about? It started off as being about Latino migration to the Midwest, because as Kate said, when I was at Penn State, oh, I was at Penn State and I was director of Latino studies there. So I was doing a lot of stuff around um, Latinos in mid middle of Pennsylvania. I grew up in this small town in Iowa, so I was, had been very interested in tracing um, the effects over the last, probably now, 15 or 20 years of the migration of Latinos into an area where there had previously been no Latinos at all, in part because of a big packing plant in this town, the very small town of 5,000 I grew up in, which when I grew up there was completely white, completely of this religion, probably never heard of, called the Dutch Reformed Religion. Um, so oh, my parents still live there, so over the years, um, as I did a lot of that activism along the US-Mexico border and before graduate school. So it was very curious to me, that, which they thought was terrible. They thought I was like some crazy person who was doing activism in some other part of you know, the world. Um, but then it was interesting as Latinos moved into Iowa, how I saw my parents and neighbors and church, you know, which um, all sort of reconsidering their relationship to race and religion. Um, and the other kind of very strange twist that I, so the book is in part about how that town I grew up in has really changed and how the religion has changed. And then the other really weird twist was that um, 10 years ago I met the man to whom I'm now married. He's from Cape Town. If you know anything about the history of apartheid in South Africa, um, you may know that the Dutch Reformed, which was the church I grew up in, um, was, was the colonizing church in South Africa. Um, so weirdly, you know, I grew up in this tiny town in Iowa, Dutch Reformed enclave, thought everybody in the world was Dutch Reformed until I went to college and then I realized that wasn't true. And then Matt Grant, who's from South Africa, grew up under apartheid, um, you know, that was undergirded and defined by the Reformed Church. Um, so that when I, when he told his mother, who's still in Cape Town, that we were getting married, she said, Dutch Reformed girls all over the streets of Cape Town, and you had to find one from Iowa. You know, so just the weird kind of geographical whatever of that. So the book starts off um, with the, uh, this is my example of how texts, I guess, I want to look at them in ways which are extremely dispersed rather than focused. Um, so I looked in the opening in the preface of the book at something called the Belhar Confession, which was this anti-apartheid document um, that was written um, originally, what's the original year? During the height of apartheid, so I think 1989 was the year it was originally written. Um, and it was written just sort of a few blocks from where Grant was going to college at the time. Um, and it was a very brave statement by Alan Bosak and other leaders against apartheid saying, we don't believe that the Reformed Church assertion that the Bible supports apartheid is true. Here's our belief of what Jesus and the Bible would say about race, that you shouldn't be racist, you shouldn't have an apartheid system, you shouldn't segregate people based on their skin color. So that was 19, I'm looking, I should know this for the date, um, 1982, I guess. There were different stages of it. But so it, that was passed during the height of apartheid in Cape Town, I mean, art, articulated in Cape Town, written. Then this, this was written by the, um, what they called themselves, the, um, the Dutch Reformed Color, the Dutch Reformed Mission Church. So. This document was written and the leaders, the people of color, the leaders in South Africa brought the document to the Reformed Church of America and said, will you agree to this, you know, in the 1980s? Um, will you agree that the Reformed Church doctrine is wrong, that it's racist? Um, will you take a stance against the Reformed Church in South Africa? And the Reformed Church, of which, you know, my family in town was a part of, said, no, 
Um, and it wasn't until 2010, just a few years ago, and apartheid ended in 1994, so it wasn't until 16 years after the end of apartheid that the church, the Reformed Church in America, passed the Belhar Doctrine. And the reason they passed it, I argue, in 2010, um, in my hometown, weirdly, where all the Reformed Church delegates were meeting, the reason they passed it 16 years after apartheid ended was that um, due to Latino migration to the area, they started to realize we don't want to be on the wrong side of history again. Families are being um, separated, undocumented people are being deported. We don't be on the, want to be on the wrong side of the law again. So it was a very interesting kind of triangulation of uh, rearticulation of church doctrine between this little tiny town in Iowa, Cape Town, and Mexico. Um, so I look at the way this text, which was written as a statement against apartheid, was finally passed in this little farm town in Iowa due to the effects of Latino migration um, and people finally recognizing that they didn't want to be perceived as a very racist church um, because their neighbors, you know, now that one third of the town is Latino, were being deported and they didn't want to be on the wrong side of the law. So there's actually a kind of a movement, I wouldn't quite say for civil disobedience in, in this town in Iowa now, but there's a real recognition that the, the immigration law is wrong, um, which never would have occurred to anybody when I was growing up there. Okay, so do you have any questions or thoughts or comments about sort of that's kind of roughly related this book to the other argument I was making about being outside literature, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about it either part. I don't, Ernesto? Oh, actually, this has nothing to do with um, your scholarship, more of your interest. I know that Grant wrote a book on, your husband wrote a book on football, soccer. I know you're a big Chicago Cubs fan. <laughs> we're going to try to write a book on you and the Cubs. Um, I wrote an article about it um, called Why We Love to Lose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I could get a whole book out of being a Cubs fan. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I come from West Michigan, so another big capital, um, Dutch. Immigrants. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I Holland. Are you back Grand Rapids or Holland? Yeah, Grand Rapids. Okay. Right on. Um, I guess um, if you have any um, historical um, arguments for why is this particular denomination or sect of Christianity have this like extensive history of racial um, segregation or um, oblivion or um, refusal to acknowledge the um, racial issues. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the to the Reformation and to the articulation of a Dutch, very Calvinist belief that there are a group of God's chosen people who are actually elected um, and predestined to go to heaven. It makes me kind of nauseous to even say it. But, um, so the way then that the Dutch took up that theology in South Africa was to say that, I mean, they actually believed they were, they, you know, quoted the Bible, quoted um, different kind of Reformed Church doctrine to say that here's this group of chosen people, they're kind of predestined to lead. Um, each, you know, they selectively chose verses from the Bible which would say, we actually endorse the retention of different cultural groups and so that can best be achieved by segregation. You know, so there was this kind of really insidious kind of defense of apartheid based on the idea that the Bible believed groups should retain their separate identities and that this was the best way to do it. Of course, that didn't acknowledge that that meant a certain, you know, people of color and black people would be the laborers and the white group would benefit from their labor. So it was all, of course, caught up in um, capitalism and imperialism and the need for a laboring class that they then used the Bible to justify. Yeah. Um, you said that you don't really see yourself as like an interpreter of texts, but um, I'm wondering if you've done any research about like how different texts are interpreted based on different cultures. Like, do they read Lolita differently in Canada and the UK than they do here, for example? Do mm -hmm. you do any research in that? And 
is there a particular text that sort of culturally is interpreted differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that that's true. Um, that's kind of the stuff I'm trying to stay away from. And I realize that there's a fine line between what's an interpretation of a text and what's a description of a text. Um, like when I was working on the single mother stuff, um, I was interested in how a lot of the texts encouraged single mothers to be self-sufficient, right? Um, and you'd see that like in a TV show, like if you remember, um, what's the show about the uh, mom with her teenage Gilmore Girls, you know, if you see Gilmore Girls? Some, I realize this generation still watches Gilmore Girls sometimes. Um, and that that claim, you know, like she's real go get them, you know, she doesn't need any help, um, of course never any discussion of food stamps or anything. And that that kind of what I'm calling like a superficial textual feature. It's very similar to the books you could see if you go to Barnes and Noble and go to the self-help section and it's like, you know, how to be a single mother. Like, and then, you know, that has all kinds of advice, like put a post-it on your fridge that reminds, reminds you to pat yourself on the back for all the hard work you do. Um, and so what I found, so those are still textual claims, right? And they would differ in different um, situations. Like I have a chapter I did try to attend to kind of the complexity of single mother, and I went to the Mexico border. I interviewed undocumented single mothers. I went to this Puerto Rican community in Chicago where there was a lot of support for single mothers. Um, but so I was trying to like again maintain this sense, like I'm interested in how these claim, these textual claims circulate across a large number of spaces, in the kind of Foucauldian way that you would do a discursive formation rather than taking one text and really kind of reading it for the meaning, for what it really says, and I'm, I'm being, I'm exaggerating here, but reading, taking, you could imagine a different kind of project that would take five novels about single mothers and read each one very closely for what it says. Um, that to me is problematic insofar as it does, it relies completely on that single text itself for your articulation of meaning. And that, to me, is not very congruent with what these texts are doing in the world and how they're circulating. Does that help? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious what sense of the word circulating you're using. Mm -hmm. um, well, it would depend on the project. Like, in this case, uh, single mothering, what does it mean for a whole our erotica, for example? I was very interested how in 1998 um, you have in Barnes and Noble a whole um, section, depending on the Barnes and Noble, but many of them um, of that said literary anthologies. But within the literary anthologies, what you could find was some pretty explicit erotica. Um, so why why package it and market and circulate have it circulate under the rubric of literary anthology? Um, what it meant was I could go to Barnes & Noble with my three-year-old at that time, my older son, and put him off in the kids section and I could read the literary, and th the erotica, um, under the guise of reading literary anthologies and take notes so I didn't have to buy all the books for my dissertation. <laughs> um, so, how do texts move in the world? How are they reviewed? Um, how are they packaged? Um, you know, kind of really kind of mundane material things. <laughs> about books or movies or whatever text you're looking at as a kind of material phenomenon. There are different, you know, other sort of things you could think about, like, um, I didn't do this, but ethnographies. I did this in the single mothering book. I interviewed a lot of single mothers. Um, yeah. Kevin? Since people in the room might be interested in different, uh, you know, your work is in you know, contemporary cultural studies, but people might be interested in other periods, maybe you could say a little bit about how methodologically this is also applicable to, of course, Renaissance. Sure. You know, sources maybe. Yeah. It's like a different, but a kind of methodology. Definitely, it's not a contemporary thing. I mean, do you? you I want to say more about that. I, don't, I couldn't give you specific examples from other historical periods. Well, I but, have to work in too, so yeah. 
But definitely, I mean, the cultural way studies. Of thinking about yeah. Posts, um, but it's also um, you're not so tightly uh, you know, identified, closely identified with working contemporary texts or contemporary culture, but uh, even historically distant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's great cultural studies work in medieval, as you say, Renaissance. I, I can't kind of describe it, but certainly it's important. Not, it's important to say cultural studies is not just about the current moment. Can I just pick up on <clears throat> your account of how cultural studies differs from you know more traditional kinds of English literary study and. Um, I'm thinking particularly about, you know, the, the place of the author and of, uh, you know, English departments still, even as they make room for cultural studies, they're still very invested in ideas of the author as sage and as genius and as authority and so on. And, you know, we haven't, we haven't gotten rid of that entirely. And I'm just thinking about how you early on mentioned Toni Morrison and Beloved, I mean, sort of the ultimate canonical living writer and canonical novel. So I'm just wondering, within cultural studies, is there a way of, 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 of dealing with those kinds of distinctions in stature or in, mm -hmm. or in authority, or, uh, just at a cultural level, perhaps? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Toni Morrison's a great example. How does the circulation of her name attached to a work shape the meaning of the text? And because everybody's heard of her, everybody accords her a real kind of canonical status. So that in itself is going to shape your reading of whichever Morrison novel you're reading. So it's not to, it's, I, you know, I think it's what Foucault called the author function, right? It's to say, not to say you can just sort of dismiss that, right? But to say, again, how does it work? How does it circulate? What effects does it have? Versus, you know, you reading, getting assigned a novel in a class by an author you've never heard of. Well, how does that make you more likely to take it less seriously. Or maybe, depending on who you are, maybe that would make you more likely to want to read it, right? Maybe you're um, suspicious of canonical figures. So definitely, that's a good example of looking at um, an extra textual feature that's still very textual in a way, but saying in and of itself it has no meaning. It only has meaning when you put it in relation to whatever prizes she's won, you know, whatever publicity she's gotten, how she's gotten to this point in her career. So maybe she is the most, I don't know, she's the most canonical figure in English departments now. They're the most widely taught. Mm -hmm. How many of you are English majors or minors? So what do you think you're going to do with your degrees? <laughs> so, so let me say, let me tell you why I asked that question, because from my perspective, this view of an English department um, makes it, enhances the job possibilities, basically. Um, because what it does is it shows that the skills we teach in English are, are very material and very applicable and practical to fields like marketing, editing, publishing, advertising. Um, to go back, to, and I'm saying this word circulation a lot, as you pointed out, but like if you sort of get outside the text, not discard the text, but if you see how the text moves, then all of a sudden you become qualified to do all these amazing things, right? Which many of our majors, I think, do already, right? But it, I mean, I think that we could do more to even um, help you see that as you're going through, um, that there are lots of um, practical as well as impractical aspects of an English degree, that they sort of go together. By impractical, I mean you love to read or something, which isn't really impractical, but it doesn't have an immediate job associated with it. But I think there are lots of um, ways you can think. And this is the sort of cultural studies school that Tony Bennett has been really influential in developing. He's been in Australia and Britain, where cultural studies has a very um, policy-oriented bent. So a lot of humanities scholars in Australia um, do work with what, I don't even know what it's called, the equivalent of their NEH or NEA. Um, so they'll, like, I was there a few years ago and did a talk in the feminist um, studies department, and one of the women who was hosting me, um, Elspeth Probin, um, writes a lo local column on girls for the, whatever major newspaper it is. She does work at the local youth group with um, girls and eating disorders. 
and she writes this really great stuff on kind of feminist cultural studies. And that's, that's no big deal. I mean, that's considered um, kind of standard practice for um, humanities professors, which I think you see a lot less of in the US. So I think that's kind of my spiel for cultural studies, that it has you know, real practical benefits as well as intellectual challenges. Yeah. Uh, so going, going back to uh, the issue Professor Gilbert raised up on the um, classical canon and how um, that difficulty of like um, identifying specific criteria on what bestow this um, stature of um, a literature as like this classical canon uh, and how you mentioned when you do your own research of um, single mother, you look at all the self-help and testimonials, but you don't necessarily focus on single author or text. Whereas, um, if I may, you, you take more of a social science approach where you're trying to get a, a general sense of the pattern and the trend. But I guess if there has been an author or a particular group of works that you uh, particularly valued as, oh, it was worth close reading. So I'm not saying, is there any classical canon that you suggest everyone should read, but in your personal literary development that you found to be valuable, hmm. that makes sense. That's a great question. Um, not really. <laughs> so are you asking, like, are there other ways and reasons to valorize texts that are, um, that allow you to make more aesthetic-based judgments about texts, in a way, that aren't so sort of seemingly, say, social scientific or kind of descriptive. Like, what about texts that just really move you and grab you, you know, and make you feel a particular way about something? Or am I putting words in your mouth now? I'm just trying to understand your question. I guess I'm just basically asking, um, are there authors or um, group of novels that you find worthwhile to do close reading mm -hmm. and take their argument to yeah. uh, the full scale. Yeah, you got me there, definitely right there. Some readers that are more, you'd have to say, more complex, more interesting, more meaningful, yeah. Um, the question's like, how much would you want to make, like I could sort of defend that as a pedagogical practice, because um, you want your students to be really moved by an an amazing text. Um, of course, there's all this, this kind of gets back into that question of judgment that I'm trying to stay away from. Um, like, who's to say? Like, my, my choice for the syllabus for my class might be full of texts I find incredibly moving and complicated that you might feel like, this really sucks. You're like, why do I have to read this? This is so boring, or this is whatever. But because you're the student and I'm the teacher, you have to read it. And the way I'm going to guide you through the reading of that text is probably going to be based on my reading, right? I mean, I'll ask you a bunch of questions that are seemingly <coughs> open-ended, but I can guarantee you I have in my mind my reading of the text that I want you to get. And isn't that incredibly frustrating for you? You're kind of nodding your head. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it to you now again. I mean, I just think it is sort of how English departments work, and it can be really exciting, but I, I think, even as a professor, I find it kind of frustrating, because I realize I will leave the class thinking, that was really disingenuous, because I wanted discussion, I was asking all the seemingly open-ended questions, but I really had an agenda. I really wanted them to under read the text this way, and they, they didn't quite get it, you know? So that's, a, that's where Bennett's critique of the kind of moral figure, the, the literary critic as inculcating a set of values in you as readers or students comes in. Um, and I think that's a really interesting and important position. It doesn't really fully answer your question about then um, aren't some texts better than others? I mean, for, you have to be able to make those decisions. And so I guess Bennett would say, well, you make those decisions for clearly stated reasons. What are the reasons? Can you be somewhat more objective about those reasons. Can you say, and this goes back to the more materialist questions, you know, can you say, I'm, I'm teaching this text because I want to see how single mothers are positioned in this year, in this place. Um, yeah. 
You looked like you were going to ask. Are you, yeah. yeah, go ahead. You haven't said anything yet. <coughs> um, sorry. Um, if you don't want to impose like a specific interpretation of the tax, how would you like lead a discussion without being biased? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was just trying to answer that. Or, again, a really good question. Like, can you do it um, by stating your criteria for examining the text, right? Rather than assuming there's come some kind of open-ended discussion we're all having in which anything would go. So I want you to read this text. Like, I asked this question a lot, too, in the women's porn book. Like, um, what are some specifically stated criteria for interpreting this erotica? rather than, this just doesn't turn me on, this is just boring, these characters are terrible, you know, like all those sort of valid but very subjective criteria you might imagine being used to analyze erotica. So I said, well, what is the thing that unites all these various texts that call themselves women's erotica or women's porn? And across the board, I would say 99.9% .9 of those texts had a clitoral orgasm in it. Um, and so it was really, you probably didn't think you were going to hear that phrase today, did you? But across the board, the one textual feature that they all had in common was women coming through the stimulation of the clitoris that's not represented in most mainstream porn. I said, that's really interesting. So I went through the text, and it was kind of fun, yeah, fun research, and, and examined those scenes and what they seemed to be getting at. So again, there's a fine line. It's still, it's still, you're right to suggest there's an element of interpretation there, but it's different from doing sort of an extended reading of one story, trying to get at the kind of heart of the meaning of that story. Does that work, sort of? Yeah. And so you were going to say? Uh, actually, pretty much a very similar question. It's like, how, as like an educator and a scholar, you, you're trying to get away from like making judgments, I guess. But like, how would you go about your work without, like, on a basic level, like evaluating something mm -hmm. and whether it's like worthwhile to teach in a classroom or to like write about. Yeah. Yeah, again, these are all great questions. Um, but again, I would say there is a distinction between an evaluation that searches for sort of a deep interpretive meaning of a text and a description, which is more, it's still, if you want to use your word, you could judgmental insofar as I really think single mothers should not be demonized for being single mothers. That's, that's a pretty, you can call that a judgment, right? And that was one thing I wanted to argue in that book was um, it's, you know, sort of to think single mothers on, used to be perceived as the pariahs of society, the sort of threat to the nuclear family, and now they're not so much, but in some situations they still are. So how can I make that argument? So that's very much a judgment um, and an argument. But it's, again, not based on my already knowing I wanted to say that ahead of time and finding the text that will help me say that. Um, it was, it, so cultural studies really, it's one of its tenets is um, you don't know the answers ahead of time. Again, you could sort of deconstruct that. But you have to go out and do your research and look at a, at a large number, a wide number of different dispersed sites in order to make a credible argument. Um, and that again goes back to that you've got to get out of the academy, you've got to, um, it's very interdisciplinary of course, um, and this kind of goes back to the question, I, I, the proposition I made that, that having a degree in English through a cultural studies approach qualifies you to do a lot of things. Um, now there might, there would be people who say like the work I did looking at divorce law um, was not you know, what a lawyer would do. So this is sort of a whole other kind of debate about cultural studies is that it doesn't, because it's really anti-disciplinary really, not just interdisciplinary, but anti-disciplinary, it means you go and do a bunch of work in things, fields that you're not really trained to do. Like, I'm not a legal expert. I looked at new reproductive technologies. I have no training in that field. Um, but, you know, I read, no, I did read those texts closely, so you could challenge me on that too. I read the legal text closely, so it's still a practice of textual reading. Um, but it's not um, sort of, you see the distinction I'm making between a deep reading and a kind of, uh, with, I don't want to just go on, but do you see the distinction I'm making? I appreciate your questions, though. They're really good. Um, when you write, do you have specific 
Yeah. Do, do you kind of write for them, or does that influence? Um, that's a good question too. I was really nervous about this one because it's about my hometown, and I had my parents read it too because they still live there. Um, and it's quite critical. There's ongoing racism in that town, um, although they're trying um, to be less racist. Um, so I did think about them a lot. There's a lot of personal stuff in here. My husband's very private, so I was very worried what he would think about. There's a chapter that's kind of about us. Um, so, but in general, and I, what I liked about working with Temple is they also wanted um, a kind of crossover book. You know, like they liked the fact that it, I wrote it in a way that was um, intended to be accessible. I would say this is another component of cultural studies, although there are cultural studies people who are really theoretical, but the idea being you want your work to circulate in the world too. So can you use theory? Um, I used Levinas in this book um, who's got this theory of intimacy and um, what happens in the sort of vulnerability of the face-to-face -face encounter. So I was using that theory and trying to weave it throughout the book in a way that I hoped would be accessible to a lot of people. Now, I certainly haven't heard that a lot of people are reading this book. <laughs> so you have that whole question how academic books are marketed. But I do, I mean, I really believe this is sort of an ongoing question though, is how you can take um, kind of these amazing theories that we teach in English departments. Um, Foucault or Levinas or whoever, um, and write in a way that a lot of people actually want to read that. That's just a huge challenge. I don't know if some of the other professors, if you want to talk about that, how you think of your audience as a, when you're doing kind of scholarly work. Well, I, I did just say, speaking of British cultural studies, Foucault's Papers, mm -hmm. um, and also um, novelists, Ben Williams, um, so working across um, yeah. academic scholarly work, but also creative theatrical, dramatic, novelistic uh, work as, as well. So that um, mm, is, uh, a collapse, a blurring of the distinction between so it's, it's a scholarly and intellectual life that they public creative yeah. intellectual life uh, is, is uh, in my view, uh, very common in, in kind of cultural studies orientation. Yeah. But it's also risky, like if you're getting, you're writing your book for tenure, for example, and you know, you're going to be evaluated by um, an English department, whatever department, they're going to look for sort of your credentials in the field, not sort of you know, whether people can find your work, find your work accessible. So it's, it is a tricky question. Did you have something else in mind when you were asking about audience? For, do you? Mm, no, I'm just, uh, <coughs> lots of times if I, if I write something and it's just for myself, it's, it's very different than when I write something and I know someone's going to mm -hmm, see it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I, the thoughts or even the ideas get very modified yeah. when, when you know that other people are going to be yeah. Yeah, and again, that's why if you want to figure out text meanings, you probably want to look at what are people saying about text, because that has the, um, the reciprocal relationship between the, the creator and the audience is going to be, as you suggest, a big part of that text. That's Stuart Hall's whole idea of encoding, decoding, if you've ever had that. Probably not. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Can you join me in thanking Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.